Hi everyone, welcome to the Comic Obsessive. As always, it hasn't changed yet in spite of my multiversal experiments. My name is Jason and I'm joined by... Well, I'm Adam Piles, but we're joined by a guest today, one Mr. Todd Webb. Mr. Todd Webb, you want to introduce yourself and, and what you create? Hello, uh, I'm Todd Webb and I make comics and music and mostly comics, and uh, the past five-ish years has just been focused on a comic strip called The Poet. Very nice. Love it, love it. This is, a, I think this is our first comic strip-focused episode oh, cool. of The Comic Obsessive, so uh, delighted to dig into that work. And, and I came across your work by uh, Mr. Piles here, Adam. Uh, so I have a, a stack of your books here. A great title, Begin by Being. I'll, I'll <laughs> begin with that one. Uh, but I also love the, the name of the strip, The Poet. And so curious to talk with you about uh, your journey in creating and uh, curious about where this all started. How did you decide that cartooning was what you wanted to do and it was the path? Well, I know you just said this was like audio only, but I'll show you since we're on camera. Mm -hmm. um this this is the book that did it uh love the love the tattered <laughs> Which, loved copy yeah <laughs> yeah it's a, it's for the love of peanuts it was one of the peanuts collections by Fawcett. um this was i just checked it out so many times from the library when i was a kid or made my mom do it because i was too little to have a library card and um yeah eventually i just ended up keeping it so it still has like the discarded from when they finally <laughs> were like just take it nice um nice. So yeah, Schultz, it's all his fault. <laughs> <laughs> blame Schultz, blame Schultz. Yeah. Uh -huh. I can definitely see a similarity in tone between Peanuts and, and the poet. That kind of <laughs> thoughtful, introspective, quiet in a type of way. Uh, just just a good, nice tone you can kind of sink into. Thank you. That's that's a... That's high praise, so thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I started out wanting to do comic strips as a kid, um, had no idea how to do it. And then um, fast forward to like junior high and I shifted over to comic books because I realized that you could do comics about anything. And I thought that I could, I'm like, oh, okay. So I could maybe wrap my head around writing a single issue of a thing as opposed to something that has to be ongoing forever. Um, and so I did comic books as my my focus for all the way up. I mean, basically all the way up to the poet, which was an accident. Um, so I did lots of graphic novels and freelance stuff and all that. So I've been in doing comics for a quarter of a century, I guess. Wow. <laughs> but uh, so the poet was supposed to just be my next short book. Um, which if you if you want me to get into all of it now I can but I don't know if you have more sp specific questions or or what but I I can ramble. <laughs> we, we will follow your path. Uh, take yeah. us wherever you'd like. Yep. Um. Yeah. So I had done um. I had done this little book called The Continuing Adventures of Catherine Mansfield, mm -hmm. which was about Catherine Mansfield. I I took some of her diary entries and made little one page comics about them um but i did it in this weird way i was playing with something that uh the cartoonist seth who's a big influence on me too mm -hmm. um he had this like rubber stamp diary that he printed in one of the palookaville issues where he just would draw he would make these rubber stamps of things that he knew he would have to draw all the time so like him walking or eating or whatever and um and then he would just stamp in his diary because I, I did journal comics too, like 20 years ago um, for about a decade. And um, so I'd done that whole thing. And, um, but I was like, man, that's such a brilliant idea of just drawing stuff that you know you need to use. And then you can just fill in your word balloons or thoughts or whatever. And um, so I had some friends do an anthology and they asked me to fill up 12 pages. <laughs> and and I had this Catherine Mansfield idea kicking around. And so I just drew like a dozen panels of her walking around looking lonely <laughs> and and like these like estates and, uh, you know, like a bowl of fruit or something. And um, and then I just I didn't do rubber stamps, but I photocopied them 
So it was like 12 panels and I photocopied them a ton. And then I just found diary entries that I thought were sad and funny and at the same time. And, um, and then I just would rearrange the panels in the order that I needed and, um, and make little changes to them if it was, you know, a different time of day or if it was raining or whatever. Um, kind of riffing on what Seth had done with his diaries, but with an author that was, uh, you know, had been alive. And, um, and I had so much fun doing it that when afterwards I was like, well, I'm just going to do a book of this. And I made, you know, 30 more pages or whatever and did this book. Um, and, uh, and then I had this idea to do a comic about Georgia O'Keeffe collecting bones in the desert. And uh, it was, I was making notes for it. And then um, I was like, well, no, you know, nobody's going to want this comic except me. So I'm just going to do like, that'll just be another book that I make. And, uh, and then I had this weird chance conversation with Mark Weidenbaum. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He's, he wrote one of the 33 and a third books about, um, God, I can't remember which one he wrote. Um, shoot, you're blanking out on me, but he's, he's edited a bunch of stuff and he's always been comics adjacent. Like, I think he worked with, um, like tower records or something when they were doing the, those magazines that had indie cartoonists in them in the nineties. Um, but he was working for this new kids magazine called Illustoria. Um, and they have these themes every issue. And so he was like, I want you to do a comic if you can for, for Illustoria. Um, but I, I don't know which issue it'll be in, but one is themed outdoors and one is themed painting. And I said, well, I have this idea about Georgia O'Keeffe wandering around in the desert, <laughs> finding stuff to paint. Does that work? And he said, that's perfect. Cause then it can go in either one. And so I ended up doing like a, I think it was five or six pages version of what was going to be a book um, called uh, Georgia in the Desert. And that ran in Illustoria magazine. Um, and, uh, and so then I was like, okay, I need another real person to do. And then, then my thinking was like, maybe I can do another little short book about some other creative person that I like. And, um, and the Georgia thing used her words too. So just like the Catherine Mansfield thing used her words. Um, I used Georgia's writings to make that. Uh, the other fun thing about the Georgia comic was just confusing. I was like, if anybody searches for, for this, it'll confuse Google because <laughs> it's, it's about Georgia O'Keeffe and my name is Todd Webb. And if you search me, the other Todd Webb that comes up is the photographer. Right. who was huh. friends with George O'Keefe and Alice oh. Cyclist. <laughs> and, and so there's books of like their correspondences and stuff. So I'm like, okay, so now I'm using a letter that she wrote to the other Todd Webb to make a comic about her. <laughs> so it's just like this fun, weird nesting thing. Um, so anyways, I was in my brain, I was like, okay, I'll do, I'll do another comic about a creative person. And then I can publish all three of them together as like, you know, three, I'd come up with some kind of weird title that connected them. So it would be the Catherine Mansfield thing, George O'Keefe thing, and then somebody else. Um, but first I had to do a comic about somebody else. And uh, I'm really into poetry um, over the, like, I guess the past 15 years, I started to get deeper and deeper into it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I found this guy named Robert Lax, which lots of people don't know. Are you familiar with him at all? That name sounds um, familiar. I, I do a lot of poetry searching and uh, a lot of literary magazine hopping because I also try to get poetry out there from time to time. So the name sounds nice. familiar, though. Yeah, he was um, the way most people heard of him is he was one of uh, Thomas Merton's best friends. So Thomas Merton would write about him. And I think that seven story mountain book and stuff talked about them going to college together and hanging out and them and Ad Reinhardt, I think, was the other guy in that <laughs> trifecta. But um, so he wrote these really, really minimal poems, like really short. Um, and he would usually write straight down the middle of the page and they'd be very repetitive. Um, and I just really, really responded to his stuff. And then the more I found out about his life, I was just like intrigued. So he had, he had worked, I think he was edited 
he worked in some capacity for the New Yorker for a minute. And like, he worked with all these high profile magazines and he wrote a movie screenplay and like, like for like a B movie <laughs> and like, and then he ended up moving to Patmos, uh, the, the Bible Island um, mm -hmm. for, for uh, John. And, um, and he lived there until he died on this little island in, in Greece. And he kept writing his poems and he'd publish these little chat books and um and he just kind of did his own thing out there and so um i was like okay so i'll do a comic about him and it'll be called robert of patmos <laughs> <laughs> and uh and it'll be about robert lax uh going down to the beach and um looking at the ocean and maybe talking to some fishermen or stray cats um and uh and figuring out a poem to write and so that was the that was the idea and uh and so i then i as i was trying to figure out how to draw him um i just kept running up like against a wall i just couldn't figure out a way to to capture it and i i also knew i wanted to do it like the mansfield thing where they'd be like one page increments that would kind of add up to a story mm -hmm. um so i had that idea and um and then I just ended up changing things a little bit at a time, trying to figure out how to do this book. So I was like, well, I don't, I don't really want other people in it. I just want him. Um, so get rid of the fishermen. Um, and then I'm like, there's too many comics about cats. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to spend time trying to come up with a new cat, you know, <laughs> like, right. like there's plenty of them out there and there always will be. And that's great. But, um, you know, let's try to figure out something else. Um, so I said, maybe it'll be a seagull because he's at the beach. And then uh, and then I kept drawing it. And I'm like, I knew I wanted it to be spacious, like his poetry, but the beach was too much nothing to draw. Like, I'm like, hey, you know, like, what is it just going to be like a wavy horizon line? Right. Or something? Like, that's, it's too, it's too minimal. So then um, I said, okay, well, we'll just move him to a park and the seagull can be a pigeon. And then I'm like, now it's not Robert Lax at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then it was gonna be a book called The Poet, The Pigeon and The Park Bench. Cause I had this idea that the bench would be the third character who talked if nobody was around. And, um, and I started to draw it and I was doing it in the single page thing. And I'm like, well, okay, well it'll be like a, I'll do four, four panels instead of six this time. Cause I did six for Catherine Mansfield. And it'll be like structured like a comic strip. And then um, that was in like January of 2020. And then uh, in February, I did a comic show here in Norfolk called Noise, which is Norfolk's original independent comics expo. <laughs> That's what it stands for. Um, which is funnily enough run by the same friend who had asked me to do that anthology that I did the Catherine Mansfield thing for. Um, and uh so i did a mini comic to give away at that show and um of the first seven pages of this poet uh pigeon and park bench but when i was putting the little cover together i said that title's way too long so i just hacked it down to the poet and did that and then lockdown happened because you know mm -hmm. that thing <laughs> and uh and so i was like all right well um I mean, I'm home all the time anyway, but now I'm really home. So I'm doing these single page, four panel comics. Um, I can knock out 48 of these if I just do one a day. And uh, and so I started doing that and then um, I'm still doing it. <laughs> so it like became a daily strip by accident. I'm sorry for talking so long, but it's like, it's really weird to me that that happened. <laughs> no, I it was. It was the childhood dream, you know, <laughs> but uh, something I figured out how to do it by accident. And I, I guess doing comics in general for 20 years before helped me to, you know, get to that point. But And, and no, no reason to <clears throat> apologize for that story. That's what I like okay. about comics is how eclectic the stories are. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like you just wove together Georgia O'Keeffe and this poet and 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 man's and like <laughs> you know that that's what i love about 
comics and comic strips is almost kind of the the rock and roll nature of it where it's like anything goes you know what i mean mm -hmm. and so i i, I really enjoyed the story <laughs> yeah yeah and a, a quick google drop here i believe the 33 and a third title was selected ambient works Volume yes two. is that right okay cool, cool that's right yeah yeah everybody goes support mark he's great <laughs> <laughs> well um you know out of your your daily strip um can you, is there like maybe one or two that still really resonate with you that you would say you as a creator would be your favorite? I don't think that was one of the questions we sent you. So not trying to put you on the spot. Oh yeah, no, you can ask anything. I'm, I'm fine. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I know when I was putting volume one together, there was one that I said was my favorite from that year. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the, I think it was a joke about particle physicists or something where they were looking at, they were looking at nothing. And the poet said, um, I mean, those particle physicists really haven't made or something, <laughs> something, <laughs> something cheesy. Um, and there, there's one that, uh, this one might also be from the very first year, but it was, uh, or this, maybe it's a second, but poet said he was trying to write poems that were like, um, that were like a manual and the pigeon said, who would want to read a manual and walked away. And then and the poet said, well, who wouldn't? <laughs> so um, those are just off the top of my head, but I, I, there's some coming up that are super, I did a really weird one where I got to draw the poet with a fly head. Um, so that, you know, anytime it's tough to do funny drawings in a, in a comic that's mostly about thinking. Um, so whenever I'm, able to come up with something silly to draw i try to milk that idea too so those are always fun ones there's there's one from last year where the the poet was in like a hood mm -hmm. like a like a black just like a black robe and uh and it was at the very end of a series of strips where the pigeon had they found a ring in the parking lot like a plastic skull ring that you get from like a toy machine and um the pigeon made up this whole thing about the poet was in a secret society <laughs> and uh and then the, at the the big punchline at the end of the week was um just the poet just went like Shh, and had like a this robe on and like i thought somebody was going to comment about it because it was so insane compared to everything else that had come before right and it was just just crickets when i put it out <laughs> <laughs> so i like i like the ones where i get to be like a little weird with it to do something unexpected I love the uh, the witty one-liners. The brain is the only organ that named itself. It's something <laughs> I keep thinking about yeah. now. Uh, so love the way you do that. And uh, curious about kind of the the slog of the comic strip format. How how do you kind of generate the momentum and uh, create with the the demanding cycle of it? Um, I just try to make sure that I'm at least two weeks ahead. There's there's been times when I've been like over a month ahead and I feel like, yeah, this is great. I'm never going to lose this lead. And then automatically something will happen, like the car breaks down or something. And, and I lose days instantly just by, <laughs> by not drawing every day. But um, yeah, so usually I'll, I'll write like a week or so at a time. Um, and again, I know it's just a, an audio podcast, but like, this is what they look like, um, wow. which for the listener is just a sheet of typing paper with four sticky notes on it, where each sticky note is a panel of the, the comic. And um, sometimes they have doodles on them, um, but usually I, I just draw the, I just write the words because I kind of can visualize what's gonna happen already. Mm -hmm. um, but I have, I have all these notebooks that are just full of, um, sticky notes that cool. have random random phrases or overheard things or like you know i read something in a book that i'm like oh i can ring something out of that later and i'll just write it down and throw it in so i've got like three of those notebooks so that i'm never starting from nothing um so if i and i've got a you know a tab on my notes app on my phone for if i'm out and about and somebody says something silly or i overhear something 
um, or think I think some weird thought about a traffic light or something, you know, like whatever, I can type that down. Um, so I'll sit down and I'll just get a bunch of sticky notes and a pen and start with panel one and see, you know, what's a thought. And I also with, with a daily strip, what's nice is um, there's things that happen every year, like seasonal things, um, like the seasons themselves, but also, you know, certain holidays or whatever. And so those, those will help me too. If I know I have to write like, Oh, it's October. I got to do some pumpkin jokes, you know, like <laughs> then I can try to focus on that a little bit and, and try to think of something that I hadn't already done. And, um, but it's, it's really fun. Um, the great thing about those characters for me is that they like any idea that I have, they can hold. And I think that's the secret for doing a daily comic strip is you have to have characters that you can give anything to and then they'll put their own weird spin on it and uh i've been lucky that so far i haven't had to add any new characters yet it's just it's just them i've referenced other things off screen mm -hmm. so like there is a world around them and there's other characters that they've talked about but like so far i haven't actually had to make a new a new you know cast member puppy dog Yes, yes, new cast, <laughs> new cast member on the Comic Obsessive. We, uh, Adam and I, both have dogs, so they make occasional appearances Aww, from time to time. That's awesome. <laughs> I have a cat, but he's asleep in the other room, ignoring us. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Somebody dared oh, to fine. walk by the house. <laughs> yes, the gall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the gall. And yeah, my dog called him out on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you might appreciate his name. Uh, he came with the name Snoopy. Oh, is, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. He's a little, little black and white dog. Um, uh -huh. But um, do you ever worry about running out of ideas? Like we heard your process for how you like, you know, kind of cultivate them and put them together. But, you know, you've worked in this field for 20 years. Like, do you feel like there's ever that danger of running out or do you think it's, no, nah, no, nah, there's always ideas. <laughs> there's more yeah. ideas than you can use usually. Like I, I have work on other things um, on the side. Uh, I have a whole, uh, like an all ages children's comic series that I, like the whole first book is already like thumbnailed out from two, two or three years ago. And I just haven't even had time to draw it yet. And uh, I worked on a TV project and like, there's just things that, I, I'm there's too many ideas. There's too many. But for the for the poet specifically, like when I started, when I realized I'm like, okay, this is a daily comic. How long am I going to commit to it? Um, I said, well, I'll just see if I can do a year. And if I'm still coming up with ideas for these guys in a year, then I'll shoot for five years mm -hmm. and see, you know. And um, now I'm at the five. I'm, I'm working on year five now. Um, in the middle of the fifth year and it still is fun and um, I love it. And uh, so now I've, uh, the, I moved the goalpost to 10 years, which was Calvin and Hobbes, you know, and now we'll see, you know, if I can do it for five more, which went by very fast. And, uh, and like I said, there, it's still just the original cast. There's no new characters. And like with Peanuts, when you think about Peanuts, you think about certain characters that some of them didn't exist until 30 years into the strip, you know? Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so it's like, so I might not have even come up with the best part of this comic yet. <laughs> and I'm five years into it. So I try to look at it that way of like, there's always, there's always something. Um, but also it's like, if I, if I feel like I've said enough with them and I get tired of it or whatever, I'll just stop. Like there's nobody making me do it. I don't have publishers you know, lining up, waiting for more or anything. There's no merchandising blitz or anything you know, like that. <laughs> it's just, it's just what I've always wanted to make. So I, I really feel lucky to have like tripped into it. Very nice. Um, you keep, you know, referencing peanuts and that strip ran for 50 years. So what would you say would be your favorite, you know, decade or era or set of years for, for such a long running strip? Ooh, um, I'm a sucker visually for like the first, the first decade. Just, I really like the thickness of his line, like his ink line and how, um, 
I like how giant everybody's head is in that first decade. Like Charlie Brown's head is humongous. Mm-hmm. Um, but probably like most things, it's I feel like it it's really kicks off. It takes off on like, you know, the, the mid sixties era. Like once he's been doing it for a while and he's got the characters that he, he knows who they are by that point. Cause like in the beginning, everybody's kind of interchangeable and they're just kids, you know? But later on, it's like you get you get Lucy, and once once Lucy gets out of baby stage, and you get Linus out of baby stage, and they become right. who they are. It's like, you know, those those core characters. Um, you know, Schroeder shows up, and it's like he they all have their own distinct angle, and I feel like once once that happens by like the mid sixties, those are probably the best because it's all brand new to him. Yeah. And whenever it's like a fresh idea, it's like. It's usually the most fun because you can pick up on it. Even uh, Charlie Brown was kind of different in the first few years. Like he was a little bit Mm -hmm. more kind of mischievous and everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the guy who does uh, Pearls Before Swine. I think he pointed out there was one strip in Peanuts where he says that Charlie Brown kind of changed. And I think it was um, uh, Shermie. Is that right? Uh, playing with his train and it was like this big train across his living room and Charlie Brown's just like watching him and then he goes home and the last panel is kind of that bit a bit you know sad Charlie Brown where he's sitting there in front of his train and it's like that big it's just a yeah. one little loop you know and that was like I, a Sunday Sunday strip I think yeah and and he said that that's where Charlie Brown kind of became the Charlie Brown that everybody knows so it's interesting right. how the characters can kind of write themselves or go in their own directions or or although with the very first strip he gets punched in the face just for being himself so there was elements <laughs> planted you know early but but yeah the melancholy charlie brown definitely showed up later on for sure yeah but um yeah well, Jason, did I jump in front of you there? I think we were kind of swapping. <laughs> no, back no, and forth. you you are fine. We'll we'll go in whatever order you like. I was just going to ask, um, what do you hope readers sort of notice, take away as they're spending time with the strip? Um, I have no idea. I I, <laughs> I always go. There's like a Thoreau quote about um, improving the quality of someone's day is the highest art. Love it, and love I. It. I, I try to I try to just use that as like, you know, with all the garbage happening every single day that we all hear about and have to look at. Um, I like the idea of there still being something quiet and simple that you can see and just be like, OK, it's not it's not all it's not all terrible all the time. Right. Um, right. So, yeah, just a, like a, a pausing <clears throat> moment, I guess. I think that's what drew me towards the strip because I found it in um, a comic shop. In Winston. Oh, wow. Can I ask yeah. which one? Yeah, it was Selfish Comics in Winston. Oh, okay, yeah. We we talked about that. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, those little books, he, <clears throat> there was a table and it had the, a stack of uh, your little books on it. And I walked around it and I'm a... I'm definitely a, a superhero guy. Like I love the the Marvel and the DC and even the independent stuff, but <clears throat> I'm, I've always been a huge fan of the newspaper strips too. And so I was just, you know, looking at the table to see what was different and new and unique and everything. And I, I picked up the book and flipped through it and I found like such a peaceful tone in it. And I found it um, at the end of the school year, Jason and I both are public school teachers. Mm-hmm. And oh, awesome. Um, the end of the year, I think any teacher would agree, is a bit chaotic. You know, it's I good. I do agree. I do agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, but it's chaotic. <clears throat> and so it was nice to just find something so, like, simple, but not in an insulting way. Just, just kind of pure and and quiet. And um, I, I picked it up and I flipped through it. And I was like, well, that's interesting. I put it down. And then I came back to it and I came back to it about three or four times. And finally I was like, okay. And so I bought a couple of those books and that, that began my little journey with the poet, but like that tone that you're talking about, it's, it's definitely there. Um, it's what kind of sucked me into the work. Awesome. I am so excited to hear that there's a comic shop that has more than one of my 
comics, especially that one. Cause the poet, is, I always joke that it's like the most non, <laughs> non-commercial idea to try to convince people of it's a black and white comic strip about a poet. <laughs> it's just like, the, what else could I do that would put people off more than using <laughs> poetry in black and white and uh, yeah, so it's it's. I love that it's actually out there in the in the real world because I have no idea where they where the little books end up. Um, Do you feel like uh, the poet kind of represents? And I, I think we already know the answer to this, but I'd like maybe for a re, you know your response to it. Does it kind of represent maybe uh, a side of your personality, a side of your beliefs that just like you know the poet's op- simple observations, but that are also profound but can also get caught out by the pigeon. And like, do you feel like that's a part of your, your DNA there? Yeah, I think so. Um, There are days where I feel like the poet and there are days where I feel more like the pigeon. (laughs) And, uh, and then there's days when I feel like the bench. (laughs) (laughs) So, so yeah, it's, it's definitely, definitely all there, but, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, uh, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it there, I guess. But uh, I like it. It's got a, a fantastic tone. Um, I'll ask this question, then I'll flip it back over to Jason if he would like to ask. Sure. sure. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, this is one of my favorite questions to ask. I usually ask it of anybody we interview. If you could, you know, work with any character at all uh put your own spin on it your own style on it who would it be and what would you do with that character um historically i hate working on other people's characters um i used to when i was a teenager i i always my my go-to answer would be like oh it would be cool to work on spider-man um just because I would ignore the Spider-Man part of it. Like my Spider-Man story would be literally like Peter Parker uh, is be- busy being Spider-Man and he forgets his backpack on the roof of a building. Right. And then he has a test and he doesn't remember what building his backpack is on. And so like the comic is just just him trying to find his homework. Um, but like, I wouldn't really want to draw, like I just wouldn't want to do that. And um, my favorite TV show, of all time was the adventures of Pete and Pete on Nickelodeon. I don't know if either of you guys remember that. I do indeed. And, yes, uh, I do. And that show, we could spend a whole other 45 minutes talking about how that show changed, changed my entire trajectory. <laughs> um, but when, uh, when Nickelodeon magazine was still around, um, I was talking with my friend, Dave Roman, who was the comics editor there. Um, and we were both huge Pete and Pete fans. And so we were trying to convince them to let us do Pete and Pete comics in Nickelodeon magazine to keep it going. And we even, you know, kind of thumbnailed some out. And um, that, you know, like that world would have been super cool to play with. But then fast forward um, to this past decade. And I, I kind of did because Mike Morona and Danny Tambrelli, who played the two Pete's on TV, started their own podcast called The Adventures of Danny and Mike. And they asked me to do their artwork and stuff. <laughs> and I ended up doing a comic strip recap of the first year or so of the the comics so, or of the of the podcast. So like there is the Adventures of Danny and Mike comic strips that I did, you know, starring them. <laughs> So it kind of happened already for me. <laughs> That's awesome. That is super cool. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Dave Roman there as well. Really yeah. Enjoy his work. Uh, Unicorn Boy, I think, was uh, last year. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. V- very nice guy. Uh, I was going to ask if I can tuck a poetic question here mm-hmm. of uh, any particular voices in verse that you're currently enjoying any poetic jams that you find inspiration in oh gosh um i mean ron paget is probably my favorite mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's still around um i actually uh i tried to to get him to do a blurb for the first book when i was putting it together and he said uh 
you know, he said, I don't do, I don't do blurbs anymore. <laughs> you know, like I decided a long time ago. And, uh, and then I tried to hook him in by saying like, um, cause I know him and Kenneth Koch, who was a, another favorite, like I love the New York school guys. Mm -hmm. Um, but they did comics together, you know, mostly words, but like the, those guys loved comics. And, um, and, uh, so I was, I said, well, what if I just sent you a poet strip with no words and you fill in the, the balloons, would you be down for that? And he said, uh, he said, I'm, uh, I'm not in the mood. I'm in the other mood. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I ended up using that sentence of his in a strip at some point. And I can't remember. I think, I think a pigeon ended up saying it. Um, but so that was, that was my secret collaboration with, with Ron Padgett. But, um, yeah, that those New York school guys. I love Joe Brainerd. I love um, his the um, the collected writings of Joe Brainerd book mm -hmm. is one of my top books to go to for um, inspiration. Just because it's like journals and poems and essays and drawings and a uh, little bit of everything in there. Um, who else? Um, Aram Saroyan is another guy that I really like who does super minimal stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually got to work together on a weird video thing. Um, but I like his stuff, I'm trying to scan the shelves and see. Um, contemporary poetry wise, um, I like Heather Crystal a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, her poems have awesome titles. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, but I, it, it's always around. Um, but I tend to go back to those New York school guys quite a bit, just because it's conversational and playful. Yeah, uh, I'm a big Jericho Brown fan. So so anytime I can find like a YouTube video of him reading one of his poems, kind of have it on in the background. I always enjoy that, and I don't usually get to ask about poetry as inspiration for <laughs> comics. So I love those connections too. James Tate too. Yeah, yeah. Eland in retirement. Great sort of strange poem. <laughs> Love that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh well, I think I have one more official sort of question and then I'll kick it sure. over to Adam for any any further questions. And that is you've mentioned a little bit about the um creative vision that you have, uh continuing to explore the world of the poet. If I'm a listener out there and I want to find out more about you and going to check out your work either at a convention online or, or wherever it happens to be any sort of plugs that you'd like to include there. Um, everything's always at toddbot.com, uh, T O D D B O T. Um, uh, and, uh, at social media, I'm trying to do less and less of, but my, my social media handle is just my website spelled out. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but toddbot.com is always going to be the, the easiest place to find out um, whatever the latest thing is. Um, I do less comic shows the more the years go by, just because comic shows tend to be less about comics. True, um, true. So um, I've been doing more zine fests lately, which are a lot smaller, um, but more fun. Uh, I've got Greensboro Zine Fest coming up near nice. you guys. Um, that's that's in like two weeks, I think. So that's probably the the one. That's the one I know about. Oh, and then I'll, I'm doing SPX for the first time in like 20 years um, this September. So I'll be at Small Press Expo. Cool. Which I used to do all the time and haven't haven't in ages. So that'll be fun. We we were just in Greensboro uh, doing comic shop visits, and um, we could do an entire other episode about social media minimalism i think that's something we all three <laughs> have in common <laughs> yeah it's it's uh it's just gotten crummier and crummier <laughs> yeah yeah for sure art art is the saving grace of any of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff mm -hmm. in uh in regards to the shows that you attend i gotta ask about um a particular habit that you have at, at the shows that you attend do you still do uh the uh portraits the crayon portraits oh yeah yeah so i i do uh 
I have a sign that says, I will draw you in crayon for $1 and it will be awesome. <laughs> and, um, and I have a tip jar named Timmy the tip jar with a little face on him. Love that. And uh, people will come up and get drawn and I, it takes about a minute. And I've, I haven't, I stopped counting them a long, long time ago, but just at San, like I did San Diego Comic-Con for about a decade. And just at that show, I would do, you know, like a thousand of them in a week. Right. Um, so I, I estimate over the past uh, 15 years or so since I started doing it, it's probably like, probably upwards of like 50,000 of those things out there in the world. Wow. <laughs> nice. Just nice. floating around. I don't track them either. You know, like sometimes <clears throat> people will bring them back and show me like, oh, we, you know, you drew me when I was single and then you drew us when we were dating and then. You drew us after we got married and when she was pregnant and then there's a baby and then now he's 10, draw him now. It's like, okay. <laughs> so like that happens, which is super cool. But uh, always, always a dollar though. Never, never going to go up. That's really cool. Um, I know. So uh, when you and I were uh, talking a little bit back and forth, um, you said, I, I said, do you ever go to Heroes Con? And you said that it kind of coincides with like your anniversary or something. Mm -hmm. So you can never get down there. Um, yeah. Have you ever been to Heroes Con? I finally made it this, this year. Like um, I had a friend who was driving down for a Saturday and he was like, do you want to ride with me? I'm just going to go down and come back. And uh, I had some friends that were there that I wanted to see. So I said, yeah, sure. Cause it, it was, the week the weekend before my anniversary this year oh okay <laughs> so it wasn't on it and it it wasn't father's day this time right. so um i said yeah i can do that so i finally got to go see it and it just made me wish i was able to do it more mm -hmm. it seems like the most well-oiled machine of mainstream comic shows that i've ever witnessed everything was so smooth even as just a you know just coming in as a guest was or a yeah attendee which i i never do it was also very weird being like just at a comic show with nowhere to go <laughs> <laughs> which is, was very foreign to me um but it was it was a delightful show i ran into so many friends and um even just walking around trying to find where my friends tables were i would run into people that i knew in you know in passing um that were just there with their families and stuff and uh it was it was great i uh i'm jealous of everybody who gets a table there <laughs> seems seems like a great show it is we we are big fans mm -hmm. uh absolutely we've been how many years have you been jason this was year three yeah yeah and i've been a little bit more than that i started going a while back and you know it's like you say it's very well organized and just a, a really good vibe yeah, it was it was great. There's plenty of walking space and uh, room around tables to talk with people, and um, just a great great selection of stuff too. And I I did some digging, which I usually only do at Baltimore Con because that that's like the only kind of uh, mainstreamy show that I had still been doing, <laughs> where uh, there was retailers. Um, I don't know if you guys know Jason Hamlin at all. Mm -mm. Um, he has a comic shop up here called Cerebral Vortex in Richmond, um, but he does, he'll show up at, at conventions with a nice spread and usually I'll go visit him. But um, at Heroes, I found found a couple of booths that had a bunch of old, you know, Nancy comics and stuff that I like. <laughs> so it was, it was fun to just like, after I was done catching up with everybody, it'd be like, oh, I can just go walk around and dig through long boxes without having a clock tick <laughs> to be back at my table or something. So, yeah, it's super fun. Very cool. Well, Jason, do we have anything else for the distinguished Mr. Todd Webb here? Just, just many thanks, much appreciation, and, and glad to have you back on anytime to talk comics and oh, other things. Whenever. I, I would love to talk more about comics. I, there's... That's my, the one thing I'm in Virginia beach and there's nobody really here to talk comics with. So anytime yeah. you guys are like, Oh, we need to kill time. Who can we, <laughs> who can we kill time with? I'm around. <laughs> Do you ever watch any of the um, comic strip documentaries? Like the one about mm -hmm. Bill Watterson and Calvin and Hobbes or 
I watched yeah. it. Okay. Which, yeah. which one? Um, I'm <clears throat> having trouble remembering the name, but it's something like a well-drawn life or something like that. I got it from Amazon and um, hmm. the creator of Kathy was on there, the creator for, uh, for better or worse, and just several. Uh, creators were on there and just talking about their process too and i, I didn't mm -hmm. know you being such a fan of those if you were uh, a fan of yeah documentaries anything um comics related especially um pre-internet stuff you know like i would i would uh just take whatever i could get um there's the um the Words and Pictures Museum that Kevin Eastman had mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. was a place that I was at all the time um, when I was a teenager. And um, I got lots of stories about that place <laughs> too. But um, so any, any, and they would, they would show those kinds of documentaries in one of the, the rooms, there was like a drawing room there. Um, yeah, any, anything the library had, I would gravitate towards. And then yeah, in the, in the YouTube age, if there's something that I haven't seen, I'll usually watch it. I, the Bill Watterson one, um, I, I always get kind of bummed out by those because I feel like they're just trading on the name. Right. Because he's never going to be in, in any of them. So it's like, you know, I, I like learning about other people's experience of fandom too. You know, it's fun to see like what they're trying to do, but it's just, just like people who are trying to find J.D. Salinger and stuff. It's like, it's <laughs> never going to be about him it's going to be about them and their struggle trying to find him which they never do um but i do love bill waters and something fierce i was at um i finally got to go to the billy ireland museum in ohio yeah because they had um ah, is that hair in my mouth? they had the um this thing called nancy fest there like a big ernie bushmiller show and um greatest and most nerdiest thing i've ever done um <laughs> as far as like making a pilgrimage somewhere, but that museum was mind blowing. And they had um, just in the main, the main exhibit room, like the permanent side of it, they had a wall of Calvin and Hobbes mm -hmm. art. And it was, um, it was pretty mind blowing to see that stuff up close after, you know, absorbing it through newspaper ink <laughs> for so many years. Um, and yeah. Yeah. All that just to see the amount of ink and and white out on those pages it was just like it was wild yeah i um i actually listened to your interview with the uh the peanuts podcast the unpacking peanuts <laughs> um and uh i was kind of yeah i thought it funny like how much our, our stories kind of match up like i went into teaching instead of cartooning but like I went to the library as well, and I checked out the, the Peanuts and the Calvin and Hobbes. And in the um, in the other podcast, you mentioned Wizard Magazine and Jeff mm -hmm. Smith, and you mentioned um, what is it, Trent Canuga? Is that is that the way to say his name? Yeah, yeah, he did Creed. Creed, and I remember <laughs> reading that article and thinking to myself, "Oh my gosh, maybe it is yeah. possible. Maybe you know, yeah, you can do it. You can yeah. you can do comics that are that yeah." Um, yeah, so if you, uh, not to get into other podcasts too much, but are you, have you been following Unpacking Peanuts at all? Yeah, I've listened to several of them. Yes. Okay. So we, we, me and Jimmy had a little beef, a public beef <laughs> over, over Ernie Bushmiller, um, that just came to a head in the last, the last two episodes of Unpacking Peanuts. So while I was at Nancy Fest, I had all, so Jimmy hates Ernie Bushmiller and he, said because on my interview he said who's your second favorite if schultz is the top and i said ernie and he said i was lying <laughs> <laughs> and like uh and went off and um and so at nancy fest i brought that to the attention of um the uh, ernie bushmiller society folks <laughs> and and got all of the famous Bushmiller fans that were in attendance to call the Unpacking Peanuts hotline and just leave <laughs> messages for Jimmy about why he was wrong about Ernie, and um, and they played a bunch of them a couple of weeks ago on the show, and then this this past one that just came out was him uh, having spent some time with <laughs> with the strips in earnest and talking about how his his views may have changed slightly. <laughs> 
That's so I, I I love unpacking peanuts and I, I Jimmy I've, and uh, and Harold I've known since I was like sixteen or seventeen. Oh okay. Um, Michael I've only met once or twice in in the real world, but they're all great great guys. But yeah, if you wanna if you wanna hear some podcast beef, listen to the last two episodes of Unpacking right. Peanuts <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a couple of cartoonists getting aggressive about uh, another cartoonist, you know. That's... Yeah, Dennis, Dennis Kitchen told me I should elevate it into a full blown war, like a war, so that everybody would just be talking about it. But right. can't I can't push it that hard. <laughs> I like Jimmy too much. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned the Billy Ireland um, Museum too. That was another question I was going to ask if you had been there. Um, so you know. It's great to hear that it was such a rewarding experience for you to visit that. Oh, it was absolutely amazing. Okay. Because I, I myself had, you know, like, like I say, uh, we're both teachers. And so I had thought, you know, one summer I was like, ah, that's about six hours away. Maybe I can plan out that trip. But uh, so it's worth going to, is it? Totally, totally. And the, the Bushmiller shows up through the summer too. So if you can get there over the summer, cool. I definitely recommend that. And if, if you can't, they published a book, um, like a catalog of it, it's 30 bucks and it has the, that entire Bushmiller show in, in a book. So they reproduce all the original art that's there and everything. Awesome. Uh, it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Well, this has been great. I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Um, I really enjoy your strip, the poet. So it's been, kind of special to, to talk to you. Uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, I really appreciate your work. I uh, appreciate what you do. Jason, you want to take us out, play us out? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Mr. Webb, we are an open channel, so so glad to chat again sometime very soon. But we always like yeah. to tell people out there to, to stay obsessive, and comic strips are a great thing to be obsessed with. You get one every day. You get that daily dopamine. Um, so hope everybody out there stays obsessive and uh, contact us either through um, you know send us an email at the comic obsessive at gmail.com or reach out I will post something about this interview on uh, Instagram and uh, reach out to us let us let us hear from you we'd love to so I guess uh, we'll sign off by saying stay obsessive <laughs> <laughs>